Congress. It's, uh, it's a special pleasure to see so many colleagues, uh, former students, friends uh, in the audience, and it's great to be able to, to see everyone. It's just a thrill to be with thousands, literally thousands of people uh, who, like myself, love honeybees and are willing to go anywhere uh, to hear more about honeybees. Um, I think we all share a, a deep appreciation for three aspects of, of honeybees. One, the amazing products, the important products that they produce, the essential services that they provide to humankind in the name of pollination. And then, in general, our fascination with this creature, with its incredible social behavior, produced with a brain the size of a grass seed. And we all share in the wonderment of how it is possible uh, that nature has led to the social evolution to be able to give us this amazing creature. So it is, it is that aspect that I want to share with you uh, about today, uh, some of our studies related to how we search for the genetic roots of social life and how we can try to understand uh, the forces that have given rise to honeybees. Let's set the stage in a very broad sense. So this gives you a sweeping picture of the evolution of life on the planet. Don't worry, there's no quiz after this. I circled the two most important things for today's discussion, and that is the evolution of the individual, and then the evolution of the insect societies, honeybees being a key example of those. Now you'll notice the title of my talk is from me to we, and I, this slide says we to me to we. It's not supposed to be a tongue twister. It's supposed to illustrate that bacteria, microbial life, started socially and has remained social. And they have their own ways of doing things, and we're not going to talk about that today. What really has given rise to the interest in understanding the insect societies is that there was the evolution of the individual, the me I wanted for myself, for my offspring, not for yours, competition. That's what starts this trajectory, leading us to how do we then get cooperation. So I want to tell you four stories today, talk about how bees think like fish and mice, the provocative proposition that there could be bees that show similarities to humans on the autism spectrum, the idea that cocaine makes bees dance more. We just saw some gorgeous pictures of bees dancing, but there's no connection there at all. And then finally, the idea that sick bees stay home from work. As we proceed, I want you to keep in mind that bees are an example of the insect societies, primarily the ants, the bees, the termites, and the wasps. And together, they account for some really amazing properties of, of cooperation that give rise to some traits that, for better or for worse, have shaped life on the planet. Cooperation, language, manufacture, construction, agriculture, and warfare. So we humans do not own the rights to those traits. They have been around for hundreds of millions of years before we evolved them. <coughs> I use genomics a lot in, in the research that I'll be talking about today, so I thought it'd be important to spend just a couple of minutes giving you a quick primer on genomics, genome. There are a number of talks throughout uh, this, this spectacular conference and perhaps this will help as you go forward in the conference. So first of all, what is a genome? A genome can be considered as a book of life. More In a more technical sense, it's a large piece of DNA. It's composed of both genes and parts of genes that regulate the genes. Excuse me, parts of the DNA that regulate the genes. So it's composed of genes and then segments of DNA that regulate the genes. It's a book of life. It contains history, the history of the evolution of species on this planet. It contains instructions, so it's a present tense book. 
how to build, how to rejuvenate organisms, how to repair brains, and it's also a future-oriented book, a prophecy. What species are at risk for climate change? What risks does your genome tell you about the likelihood that you'll get heart disease or cancer? Prophecies. Now, it's important to realize, as we talk all about genomics, that genes have a very specific role in this process of life. They encode proteins. The basic building blocks of biology are indicated for you in the slide. DNA, RNA, and protein. DNA is where the information is. It gets moved to RNA, and the RNA transfers that to the proteins. And it's the proteins that do all the work. It's the proteins that build your bodies, the proteins that build your brain, it's the proteins that do all of life's work. So that's a little bit about genome, DNA, and so forth. What is genomics? Genomics, then, is a science, a still new science, a 40-year-old science, that uses information from genomics to solve grand challenges. Genomics seeks an expansive view. It takes on the big problems. It, it's undergirded by two things, an appreciation and a dedication to new technologies, so once upon a time, we could only measure one gene at a time. And let's say in our own field of social behavior, we realize, well, that's not enough. There's so many genes that influence social behavior. We need more. Technologies were developed to be able to measure more genes, all genes. So technology undergirding genomics. And secondly, the basic principles of evolutionary biology. So you take technology, evolutionary biology, and then, of course, molecular biology, which is the direct source of the techniques that genomics is based on, and you have genomics. One important aspect of genomics that features in today's talk is that another way to ask the question, what is a genome? A genome is dynamic. On the top, you see the green arrow representing the traditional approach to our understanding of genes, brains, and behavior, a deterministic pathway going from genes to behavior. Genes cause changes in the brain that then give rise to changes in behavior. That perspective, which dominated the field of behavioral genetics for many, many years, is still correct, but we now know it's only half of the story. The other half is the red arrow, which goes, as you see here, social information, but that's really just a stand-in for the environment. The environment affects the genome. An important insight that genomics has delivered for us, which is really key to a better understanding of the relationship between genes and social behavior, and a way to understand the relationship in general to avoid all of the terrible misinterpretations of genetics that have given rise to some of the most shameful chapters of human history, such as eugenics and the Holocaust, to name just a couple of them, based on a poor interpretation, a misinterpretation of the relationship. We now have the tools to understand the relationship properly, which is this two-way arrow. So it's one of the early fruits of genomics with direct relevance to the studies of genes and social behavior. A couple more bits of background information, and that is honeybee genomics. So I show to you here two really important dates in the history of honeybee research. One was the release of the honeybee genome projects, fruits. You heard a little bit about this from Carl. So a special issue of journal Nature devoted to many articles, over 66 authors, uh, that gave rise to an analysis of the honeybee genome on the 26th of October in 2006. October 1st was the release of a National Research Council report, chaired by my colleague and friend, Professor May Berenbaum, and I was honored to be on this report as well, which was on the status of pollinators. That report sounded an alarm, saying we think that pollinators are in danger and more study is needed. A few weeks later, the honeybee genome uh, was announced. And look what happened just a few months after that. Colony collapse disorder first came on the scene 
and the first paper about colony collapse disorder was published in Science, making use of the honeybee genome. The Honeybee Genome Project was funded primarily by the National Institutes of Health because of that third aspect that I mentioned before, its amazing social behavior. Honeybees are used as models to understand the evolution and the mechanisms of social behavior. So we had the resource there so that when crisis arose, it was possible to use those new technologies, the new information, um, to be able to start to get a handle on this. And one final example is that uh, the U.S. government asked Professor May May Berenbaum and I uh, to use a new technique that we had developed at Illinois to measure the activity of all the genes to kind of start to get a handle on what's going on with colony collapse disorder. And what you see is a heat map. I won't go through it in detail. I highlighted the key pieces of information for you um, to take from this. And that is we saw that there were some antibiotic genes going down in their activity, some pesticide detoxification genes going up and down in their activity, and PA and FL stand for Pennsylvania and Florida. CA stands for California, states in the United States. And you can see that there were differences. If you just sit back and look at the patterns, you can see there were striking differences between the California bees and the other bees. The point of all of this is not the details, but there were multiple things going on there. Not just one thing, not just one set of genes dysregulated. That was an early clue that colony collapse disorder has multiple causes. And that's, of course, now the scientific consensus. So again, it's an example of how we've used genomics to be able to get insights of practical importance. So now to the four stories that I want to talk about today. First one is a collaboration with the individuals that you see in the picture below. Uh, the institute that I'm privileged to lead, the Carl Woese Institute for Genomic Biology, uses team science. There are no individual laboratories in the institute. One works with teams. So my lab is privileged to work with the individuals that you see there. We study together honeybees, fish, stickleback fish, and mice. And we ask the question that is posed for you on the slide. Do brain responses to social information involve evolutionarily conserved mechanisms? That is, do these three very disparately related species think the same way? Do they respond similarly to a challenge or to an opportunity? So we designed behavioral assays related to territory intrusion for social challenge. We designed behavioral assays for social opportunity that relate to reproductive opportunities, parental care, alloparental care, and in the case of honeybees, big sisters rearing little sisters as queens, because as we all know in this room, workers engage in little, if any, personal reproduction. It's all about the colony. So we expose the bees and the mice and the fish to these uh, experiences. Actually, I show you nice pictures of how they look in the field, but we, we designed laboratory assays, such as the one you see on the bottom, a classic uh, intruder assay that was developed first by Mike Reed from the University of Colorado for honeybees. We expose the animals to the experience. Then we sample appropriate parts of the brain, parts of the brain that have been implicated in responding to social information in general, but in their own ways, in their very different species-specific ways. And then we ask whether there are changes in gene activity that are associated with those experiences. That's question number one. And question number two is, and do those changes in gene activity, if they occur, are there any parallels between the three species? So I pose these two questions. The answers to those two questions are not on the slide you're looking at, so I'm about to answer those two questions. Are there changes in gene activity in the brain when an animal, such as a bee, a mouse, or a fish, exposed to, a, say, a social challenge? The answer is yes. Hundreds of genes show differences in activity. Some go up, some go down. Second question, are there any commonalities to those three lists of genes? Yes, statistics can tell us there's a significant overlap in 
those sets of genes. Some of the same genes respond the same way in those three very different, very distantly evolved species. Now we're to the slides, just to give you a couple of high points. It's possible to be able to take a gene list and then use information about what the genes are known to do to ask whether, not just whether they're common genes, but common themes related to what the genes are doing. And these, what you see in front of you, are themes at different technical levels called biological process, processes that go on in cells, processes more at the molecular level. But all of those terms that you see represent themes in biology that are common to the honeybee, the fish, and the mouse as it responds to a social challenge. One of them I'll show you some data to support in a minute, and that's metabolism. Second high point to take from this is that there are some sharing, some common genes of a particular nature that we take note of. These are genes called transcription factors. Transcription factors are genes that tell other genes what to do. That's their job. So if you see commonalities of those genes, you know that it's not just a set of genes that are common, but gene networks that are common. So in other words, three very distantly related species, two vertebrates, one invertebrate, show common molecular responses that involve some common biological themes to a social challenge. Even though the social challenges are very different, and even though the responses are very different in each species. One of, the, one of the changes I mentioned was a change in brain metabolism, and at this point you would be right in wondering whether the changes that we have been recording and that I've been telling you about mean anything, whether they have any real functional significance. So the answer is yes. When a bee is exposed to a social challenge, there are changes in the genes that reflect changes in the metabolism, in the way the brain processes and produces energy. Those changes make the bee more aggressive. What does that have to do with the response to the social challenge? Well, ecology predicts that if you are exposed to something threatening, there's a pretty good chance you're going to be exposed to something threatening again. And so the exposure does two things. One, it causes you to respond immediately. In the case of bees, they will respond by attempting to kill the intruder, as we all know, as beekeepers, an intruder at the entrance. But secondly, it will put the bees in a more vigilant state for a period of time. Now, many of you will just realize that I spent several minutes telling experienced beekeepers what they already know, which is that if you disturb a colony, you should stay away from it for a while, right? But indulge this scientific nerd here. We arrived at the principles in a very careful way. So what you see in front of you are data to support this for honeybees. On the left, we use particular pharmacological agents that change brain metabolism. The dotted line shows the baseline level of aggression, and you can see with the treatments we increased the level of aggression. We also did this in fruit flies, where we could do the method technique in a more precise way, taking advantage of the power of fruit fly genetics, and we were delighted to be able to see also an increase in aggression, measured in this case as the number of lunges, if you look on the vertical axis. This was exciting to us because it's an entirely different context in which flies use aggression. Honeybees, as we all know, use aggression to defend their nest, whereas fruit flies use it to defend a resource, a potential mate or food. So, some deep commonalities there. Now, in closing this first part of the talk, I want to make sure we're all on the same page. Here we have a tree of life diagram that shows the evolution of the lineages leading up to the honeybee on your left, and, all, and then the lineages leading up to vertebrate societies, including humans, on the right. The last common ancestor lived some 600 million years ago, is thought to resemble a marine flatworm, very simple nervous system, no centralized brain, no social life as far as we know. And so these 
responses to social challenges, the social life in these different lineages. Therefore, when we look at the last common ancestor and it doesn't have it, therefore, the simplest explanation, explanation is that they evolved it independently. We all, there's a strong scientific consensus of that. But what these new results say is that even though they evolved these abilities independently, they're making use of common molecular building blocks. I want to push this idea of common molecular building blocks to move not just a comparison between bees and animals, but bees and humans. In the course of doing these experiments, postdoc Guy Spiegler noticed that there always were some bees when doing the social challenge assay, there always were some bees that did not respond to the challenge. Those of us that study behavior are well familiar with the idea that there's tremendous variation in behavior, so we really didn't think much of it. But then he performed the social opportunity assays, rearing queen larvae, as I told you, um, a year later, and found again some bees not responding. Obviously different bees, different colonies, one year later. At that point, we started to wonder, might there be some bees that are consistently unresponsive? So Hagai redesigned the assay to be able to test the same bees in both assays repeatedly to give them every opportunity to show what they've got. And what they had was unresponsiveness. On the left, you see the behavioral data. The key groups are red, blue, and green. Red were bees that responded preferentially to the social challenge. These, of course, we would call guards. Blue were bees that responded to the opportunity to rear a larva. We would call these nurses. And then the green were bees that were unresponsive to both stimuli repeated times. Are these bees a thing? Are they a group? Maybe the bees just had a bad day. Maybe the assay wasn't working reliably. Well, to kind of probe that, we did a few things that I'll share with you now. One, we measured differences. We measured brain gene activity, and we found differences in about a thousand genes between guards, nurses, and socially unresponsive bees. The, dis the differences were so big that using a method of clustering that you see on the right, you can pretty much see the three groups clustering very nicely. The different symbols shouldn't confuse you. They, re they reflect two different colonies. With almost all of our research, we have to perform the analyses on multiple colonies because, as all of you know, no two colonies are the same. So we replicate both within colonies, multiple individuals, and then across colonies. Our general mantra has been aim for three, settle for two, but sometimes we'll need to do ten, and uh, so forth. So you can see the clusters distinct. So another piece of evidence suggesting that they might be a thing. Another piece of evidence suggesting this comes from our barcoding methods. Uh, a computer science graduate student in my lab just finished up, now postdoc, Dr. Tim Gernot, developed a system to be able to barcode bees and be able to then, using the system that you see in front of you, conduct automatic, continuous behavioral monitoring of all the bees in the colonies. Small colonies, all barcoded with bees, and we take an image every second. Now it's up to every two seconds. The first behavior that was studied was the one circled for you, trophallaxis, where bees are facing each other and touching each other and exchanging fluids, which contain nutrition as well as key signaling molecules. So a quintessential form of social insect communication. Here's, what, here's the small hive, a single frame, one-sided one observation hive. And it's great to give a talk where I can just say that and not explain it. <laughs> so here is a picture of a social network from the data derived from that method. Um, the queen is in the center. She uh, had the most number of interaction partners and the most number of interactions. If these kinds of data are new to you, think Facebook. We built a Facebook for bees. And so Queen had the most friends, and uh, that's what we would expect. But look at the two workers there. The one on the top had almost as many interaction partners and interactions as the Queen did. And then the one over on the left, the lonely bee, just a few. This is one week of continuous monitoring uh, of the data of a thousand bees, over a million interactions uh, monitored in this way per colony. Now I point out this is not a physical network, this is a social network. 
This is not the physical position of them, but they're, they're grouped here based on the number of interactions. So, remember what we're talking about, socially unresponsive bees. Here, with an entirely different kind of assay, we have bees that are engaging in relatively little social interaction. We've pushed this a little further with the work of Adam Hamilton for his PhD. And uh, what you see on the left is another social network, but this time the bees were first evaluated in terms of what roles they're playing in the colony. Forager, nurse, aggressive, we could call those guards, bees involved in multiple uh, roles, and then non-responders. If you look on the right, the brown blob there, these are called violin plots, the brown symbols there, uh, the one on the very right, shows that non-responders uh, have, the, or I should say, no non-responders in the lab assay that I showed you before have the lowest number of interactions in the social network assay. So a nice confluence there. So that set the stage for asking the question posed in this part of the talk. Might there be any similarities between socially unresponsive bees and human autism? To perform this analysis, we used data sets that come from the human autism spectrum disorder literature. There are two different kinds. The Safari data sets on the top reflect DNA differences. So mutations, uh, variants, genomic variants between individuals. And then the data on the bottom reflect post-mortem autopsy results of gene activity. The rose in yellow indicates statistically significant overlap between our bee gene list for socially unresponsive bees and human autism. We've tried to do some controls to see how specific this effect is. We've done reciprocal controls. We've taken the bee gene set and looked at other mental illness gene sets, and we did not find an overlap. Conversely, we took the autism gene sets that I just showed you, compared those with other gene lists from bee experiments, and also did not find the overlap. So to the best of our ability, we have a specific overlap between genes that are differentially active in the bee brain in socially unresponsive bees, and genes that are different in human autism cases. You've seen this slide already, but it's really important to get something clear here. Autism spectrum disorder is a very complex set of traits. Social unresponsiveness is just one of them. I'm not trying to pose a glib or superficial comparison here. Bees are not little people, and people are not big bees. They are separated by over 600 million years of evolution, as I've mentioned. Rather, the framework that we are erecting here, thanks to the science of genomics, is the notion of building blocks. That social brains evolve independently in multiple lineages, and for some reason, we don't yet know this reason, for some reason, make use of the same genes, the same molecular pathways, the same gene networks, over and over again. So this is going to provide a strong foundation to understand why it is that certain pathways are essential to social brains. Okay, we talked then about brain building blocks, and the question then arises, okay, what do the brain building blocks build? Well, I'll say that a few times. What do they build? Well, one idea then has to do with the reward system. Now, I want to be clear, the genes that I just talked about are not the ones that are implicated in the reward system, which I'm about to talk about. It's a conceptual similarity. The idea that genes and pathways need to build stuff in brains to be able to create the social brain. And I want to show you some results from a separate line of study that support the idea that one of the brain systems that's been tuned in social evolution is the reward system. The reward system, of course, is a system that, uh, for better or for worse, motivates a large number of different behaviors. It motivates basic survival behavior. It also is hijacked in the form of a variety of addictions. This one, a fairly benign one, we all know some much more serious and tragic forms of addiction. So, do insects get addicted to sweets? Can we say they're addicted to altruism? 
can we say the reward system has been tuned to support cooperative behavior? I'll show you some experiments that support this idea. The motivating observation is indicated for you in this slide. When a solitary insect finds good food, she eats more. When a honeybee finds good food, she doesn't eat more. She comes back to the hive and dances more. We have a me to we switch here from personal ingestion of food to taking that experience and turning it into sharing it with nestmates. And of course, I'm speaking about the dance language, which many of us know a great deal about in this room, communicating distance, direction, and the value of the food. If the food is of sufficient quality, the bee will then dance. This is not a reflex where a bee finds food and dances immediately, but rather it's a very nuanced behavior. And no one has elucidated this better over the last 40 years than Tom Seeley, who you'll have the privilege of hearing right on the stage in a few days. So it's a motivated behavior, but a modulated behavior. We asked whether a chemical that causes fruit flies and other flies to eat more will make bees dance more. This is the work of former postdoc Andy Barron, who now has his own lab at Macquarie University in Australia. We used this tunnel that was developed by Manya Srinivasan in Queensland to trick bees to think, they, to think they were flying further than they did in order to be able to get good dances. I think many of you know that bees do really more precise dances if it's a longer distance. And we wanted to really be able to video the dances and separate effects on motor output from the actual motivation and performance of the dance. So we needed really good dances to um, videotape. And if you don't know how uh, Manyan Srinamasan figured out how this tunnel tricks bees to think they've flown further, you should find out during this conference. It's a really great piece of, of work. So we asked whether a chemical that makes flies eat more makes bees dance more, and the answer is yes. You see the two control groups, the green and the white, and we had a very low quality of sugar syrup on purpose. We wanted just a few bees to dance. We wanted the food to be just so-so, so that there would be room to have an effect of our drug. And as you can see, we were able to triple the number of bees that were dancing by this treatment. So that was with octopamine. We thought we would push it a little further with cocaine, since after all, cocaine is well known to affect reward systems, for better or for worse. And as you can see, cocaine, the orange bar, caused also a tripling of the number of bees dancing, uh, exactly as octopamine did. When we treated the bees with something that blocks those pathways, it inhibited them from dancing. So it looks like a fairly specific effect as far as we can go with injecting neurochemicals into the brain. Another, some other evidence to support this me and we in the dance context are seen here, two different studies. On the right, we have a slice of the bee brain. The antenna would be coming towards you. And the colored areas reflect areas that are activated. The red areas indivate, indicate areas that are active in the bee brain when it receives a droplet of sugar in the laboratory, such as that image on the bottom right. The other colors, the blue and the green, indicate parts of the brain that are active when the bee has been allowed to go to a feeder and then come back to the hive and dance. So dance responsive regions. Hopefully you can see, uh, hopefully even in the back, that the blue and green are a subset of the red. That the blue and green are embedded in the larger food responsive response. Likewise, on the left, we now have another gene activity study. And those big red circles indicate large numbers of genes that are differentially activated when the bee has gotten a droplet of food in the laboratory, the selfish me context. And then the blue represents clusters of genes that are differentially activated when the bee has danced. 
And again, hopefully you can see, in this case even more clearly, that those clusters of genes, the dance genes, are embedded in the food responsive genes. So, evidence supporting the idea that there is a need we switch and that the reward system is being engaged to motivate social behavior. Now, there's a lot of questions. We don't know whether bees dance more because cocaine makes them like their food more. We don't really know what the word like means in an insect brain. We don't know uh, another possibility is cocaine is enhancing their pleasure from dancing. Again, we don't really know what the word pleasure means. But we don't use a top-down approach. We use a bottom-up approach. We let the genes tell us what's going on and then work that way. Okay, so turning to the final part of the talk, we've built a system where we can go from E to we. We have building blocks, we have brain systems that are engaged. The last part of the talk is to say that things are tough. You know, you succeed in building an incredible society, and the small can overcome the big, as you see in that picture on the bottom, but there are also some small threats. And we want to ask how it is that the social organization of the colony is able to deal with the many small, very small threats that now affect honeybees, including virus. So I want to talk about one, IAPV, which was implicated in the very first article on colony collapse disorder, Cox Foster et al., 2007. Uh, as many of us know, it infects all life stages. It's a serious viral disease of the honeybee. I'm going to talk about some work that's a collaboration uh, between my lab and the laboratory of Amy Toff. Uh, Adam Dolezal was a postdoc in Amy's lab, and now we're honored to have him as a member of the faculty at the University of Illinois. So the basic question is, do infected bees interact more or less than uninfected bees? What's going on here? When a bee is infected, how does that get embedded in society, in social life? There's two hypotheses that come from our understanding of how humans handle the situation. One is stay at home from work. That would be the host advantage, the bee advantage, to let's not spread this around, let's stay home, let's prevent the spread. The other is the sneeze mechanism where the pathogen has the advantage. These are two widespread uh, mechanisms that we see in a variety of human diseases. So what's going on in the bee colony? Again, we turn to our barcoding system to be able to study the social network, another image of the barcoded bees. And again, um, we're using trophallaxis, the behavior I described before. And so, let's take a look at what's going on when we use that system. So the bees were artificially infected with IPV in the special colonies that I described before. Infected bees interact less. Looks like they're staying home. They're trying to minimize the spread of the virus. It's very interesting to elaborate this point when we look at this point. They move more, so it's not like they're rigid and they're, and they're not having the opportunity to interact. They're actually moving around the hive more, but engaging in less trophallaxis. So it certainly seems to be some kind of a very specific uh, effect. But the story's not finished there, because otherwise we would be sitting here and wondering, well, why are the viruses causing so many problems if, uh, if the bees have a handle on it by taking advantage of their social connectedness and altering their network in adaptive ways? Well, there's, there's more to the story. How does the disease spread? Turns out that infected bees forage more. So you see again the same color coat and the purple are the infected bees. They're foraging more. They are also attacked less by guards. The two control groups I won't talk about, DSRNA and sugar, um, you can see the virus uh, less uh, attacks, provoking less attacks, virus infected bees, than the other two groups. These, these results were obtained from a laboratory assay that's depicted below, but I'm showing you the natural context in the image above. So infected bees are attacked less by guards. They're also fed more by guards, which is a way, as, as many of you know, if you've observed robbing at the entrance, um, it's a way for foreign bees to be more likely to be accepted, is that for some reason, some feeding goes on at the entrance. 
And then, how might this all be explained? Well, when you take their surface chemicals, the cuticular hydrocarbons is the technical term from that, a set of chemicals on the bees' bodies, which bees use to recognize each other, you can see, again in a similar analysis to what I showed you before, that the differences are so extreme that you can more or less see all the virus all those words virus are each individual virus infected bees clustering separately from the control bees, from the uninfected bees and the controls. So we know that recognition is mediated by these surface chemicals and we know now that the surface chemicals are different so what remains to be done is to connect those dots to look for the causal changes, the specific changes that actually give rise to the behavior. So what we see then is a socially mediated host pathogen system that's complicated. There's less social interaction in the hive, that's an advantage for bees. That's an example of a growing number of social immunity cases in the insect societies, and we can call it today a me-to-we adaptation. But the virus is holding its own. It's associated with more foraging and more acceptance, and so these infected bees then are able to move from colony to colony to spread. So, as I wrap up, I want to leave you with three points. I think the work that we talked about today helps us address this question of how do you make a honeybee? How has nature given rise to a honeybee? I think what happens is you take the ground plan of solitary bees, and to that, you add the molecular universals of the social brain, stir it around for a couple hundred million years, and you're going to get honeybees. So that's one point. Secondly, I've talked, not so much, but indirectly, about genes that we know a lot about because they're conserved from one species to another. But I want to point out that every genome sequencing project that has ever been done so far has identified genes that have never before been seen in the databases. These are possibly novel genes. Why do I say possible? Because although we are in the genomic era, it's sobering to realize that only 0.2% of the species of plants, animals, and other eukaryotes have had their genomes sequenced to date. 0.3%. This is why I've joined forces with two colleagues, John Kress from the Smithsonian Institute and Harris Lewin from the University of California, Davis, to propose the Earth Biogenome Project, which is calling for the sequencing of all of life on the planet over the next 10 years. And we're making some very good progress um, in that. Because we need to know all of the world's genes, because who knows what's there in terms of new medicines, new understandings of biology and our understanding of what is truly a novel gene. And then third, I hope it's been clear uh, that there is a powerful interplay between basic and applied research in honeybee biology. The example of sequencing the honeybee genome and having it ready for action when uh, unfortunate events have occurred in the bee world. This, of course, is a historic strength of apiculture. You're all here to honor this tradition and I wish fit for it to continue for many, many more years. Thank you very much.